Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcoming. Uh, as you already know, we are talking about democratized data workflows at scale and how we use them at the financial times. First, a little about, about myself. My name is Emil Todorov. I'm from Sofia, Bulgaria. I've been software engineer for more than five years and I've been playing with data for more than two. And actually it became my passion, but enough about myself. Let's talk about what is our agenda for today. So first I'll cover why we picked Airflow at the first place. After that, Mikhail will talk about our Airflow architecture and how actually Airflow fits in our bigger picture. Uh, after that, he will explain what kind of security we were able to apply on top of Airflow. And in the end, I will talk about the so-called execution environment in Kubernetes we were able to invent on top of Airflow. So first, a little bit of background. Uh, back in the days, in the end of 2018, Financial Times decided to move their data platform from London to Sofia. And actually, Michael and I were two of the first engineers that joined the team. We got Clickwe on board it and immediately started to get our hands dirty. And the one thing you should know about Financial Times is that this is a data-driven company. So uh, the company makes decisions based on some data analytics, data science, models, predictions, and stuff like that. So uh, in order to allow those decisions in our data platform, we need to tackle more and more data on a daily basis. And we decided that there was a time we had to make a change. And this change was our ETL batching solution. And as, as you already figured out, we decided to pick Apache Airflow. And why we picked Airflow at the first place? Uh, first, because it's a perfect fit for our ETL replacement. And second, that Airflow is not only an ETO uh, replacement, you can schedule a lot more than ETO. You can orchestrate a lot more different jobs. You can use a lot more functionality that's coming out of the box with the project. And also there's something that I stole from the Air Force website, which I think summarizes the project very well. The Air Force project is very scalable. You can scale pretty much unlimitedly if you know how to do it. Also, Air Force is very dynamic. And by dynamic, we mean that the workflows you write in Airflow, uh, you use code to do that. And this is the reason why you can use more and more complicated workflows to cover more and more use cases in your day-to-day -day, uh, work, which is pretty useful. Also, Airflow is elegant. And by elegant, I mean that it's very explicit. It's very uh, easy to understand the basic concepts. And this is very easy for something that is new in the project and I'm talking that about personal experience because it was very easy for me it is very easy for my colleagues to understand what happens and last but not least Airflow is extendable and if there is a reason why we chose Airflow and not any other solution on the market this is exactly that one because we were able to enhance the project the way that we wanted we achieved our goals by extending the project and in order to understand how we enhanced Airflow from architectural point of view, I would like to give the word to Mikhail, who will speak more about that now. Thank you, Emil. Hello, everyone. My name is Mikhail, and I'm a senior software engineer in Financial Times, and more specifically in the data platform team in Sofia, Bulgaria. So during this lecture, I'm going to talk about our internal Airflow's architecture. First, I would like to mention that we use AWS as a cloud provider, but this architecture is applicable to any other cloud provider too. So now, what are our components that we need to have to have a running care for instance? First, we need to have a database and we use a PostgreSQL database and we use actually an RDS service provided by Amazon. So cool, but what are the next Airflow components that we need to have? Well. We need to provide the most scalable solution, but also this solution must fit perfectly into our general data platform architecture too. So the choice for us was easy. We decided to use Kubernetes and the Kubernetes executor. So in our architecture in Kubernetes is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. We have a web server pod that communicates with a database and also a scheduler pod that also communicates with the same database. Now, as most of you are familiar with the scheduler and the Kubernetes executor, 
the scheduler need to trigger a new worker pod instance for each of the task instances for each DAC. So that's it. This is the basic architecture. But now let's discuss what are the, our needs that we need to apply on top of this architecture. And we have different needs. We have business needs, we have user needs, and of course we have engineering needs. And we need to satisfy all of these needs. And actually the main requirement from all of these needs is to provide access to Airflow to different teams. So what does that mean? We need to provide an Airflow instance and this instance will be, will be accessed by different teams. And all of these teams will have different numbers of engineers that are part of each team. So this is our main requirement. And we need to satisfy this requirement, but as you can understand, this requirement and need will actually affect our architecture and it will be like a domino effect because now teams will share resources in our application and platform. And first, I'll start with the airflow resources that will be shared between all teams. So let's say that we have different teams that are part of our company. We expect that all of these teams will have their own dedicated to this team, DAX. But using the default airflows approach, now, if I'm part of team one, for example, I'll have access to the other team DAX too. So obviously these DAX will be shared between the teams. And if I, if I go deeper, well, we can talk about connections. As you know, a connection is kind of credentials and I expect that my team one will have their, my own connections and credentials. But again, we have the same problem using the default approach. Now all teams will have access to all connections and respectively credentials. But our teams will share not only uh, Airflow resources, they will share also Kubernetes resources too. So what does it mean? We need to provide a Kubernetes cluster and in this Kubernetes cluster, there will be many worker pod instances and each of these instances will be actually owned by a different team. But using the default Airforce approach, now all of these worker pods will share the same service accounting Kubernetes, for example. So obviously they will share the same permissions and eventually depending on the permissions, they will be able to interact between each other and potentially to even affect the other worker post behavior, performance, and output. So obviously all of this leads to security issues. Of course, these issues are security issues not in Airflow itself, but from our point of view and based on our needs and requirements. So obviously we need to evolve this architecture. And actually there are different ways how we can evolve this architecture and improve this negatives. And the first possible option for us was to provide an Airflow instance per team. So what does that mean from Airflow's point of view? We need to provide one component instance for each of these components. We need to provide an AWS account per team. We need to provide a Kubernetes cluster per team, PostgreSQL per team, and last but not least, of course, an Airflow instance per team. But then we started asking ourselves questions. Is this the best approach? And what are actually the potential problems that come with this solution? And actually there are many problems. For example, adding a new team will be extremely hard because now we need to add one component instance for each of these components. And this is error prone, this will require additional effort from us. And even if we manage to somehow do this, well, we need to still support all these environments. And this will be quite difficult because in future, we may have not only one, two or three feature environments per team, but we may have 10, 50, even 100. So obviously this solution doesn't scale very well. And even if we somehow manage to support all these environments, well, releasing new features will be also slow because we need to release one feature to all these environments one by one. And in future, most probably not all of these environments will have the same version. So releasing this feature will be actually even impossible sometimes. Also when having environments per team, these teams will have different hardware resources and we will not be able to fully utilize these resources. And all of this leads to total cost increase. And not, not only about software and hard, hardware costs, but I'm talking more about engineering costs because now when we add more and more teams to the platform, well, we need to add more and more engineers to our own platform. And obviously we can spend this money in a much better way. 
and this is not the best solution for us. Rather than spending this money for engineering costs, infrastructure, and support, we can spend this money on providing features and benefits on top of the platform and providing business value to the company. So obviously, we need to find some other way to provide these requirements and needs. And actually, there is another way. The other way is multi-tenancy. But what is actually multi-tenancy? Well, the shorter description is multiple independent instances in a shared environment. But what does that mean from Airflow's point of view? Well, we need to provide one component instance for each of these components. Only one component instance for each of them, rather than an instance per team. And we need to make them multi-tenant. So we need to provide the software separation between the teams on top of all of these components. And I'll quickly explain to you for all of these components how you can make them multi-tenant and what is our basic approach. So first, I will start with AWS. So how to make AWS multi-tenant? Well, we have only one AWS account, and the easiest approach is to have an IAM user per team. So for this specific IAM user, we can generate access and secret access keys. And using this approach, now this specific team will use these keys to out authenticate and authorize their user in our Airflow application and in the platform at all. And in future, when we need to add more and more teams to the platform, we just need to add more and more IAM users for each of these teams. But obviously, most probably you are familiar with these keys and Amazon. So when using keys, now we need to persist these keys in our metadata database. We need to persist them in a secure way. We need to rotate the keys. So obviously this has an additional overhead and effort to our team. And there is a better solution. Rather than using keys, we can use AWS roles. Because using this approach, we can delegate part of the security to a managed service provided by AWS. Of course, this architecture can be extended even more. We can have groups, we can attach different users to different groups, and etc. But this is the basic approach. So let's now move on to the next component, and this is a Kubernetes cluster. So how to actually make the Kubernetes cluster multi-tenant? Well, obviously we need to have only one Kubernetes cluster. And the first step to provide multi-tenancy is to actually have a system namespace. So how is that beneficial for us? Well, we use the system namespace to deploy and run their all services that are shared between all teams. And if something is not shared between all teams, if it's dedicated to a particular team, it should not be part of this system namespace. So from Airflow's point of view, it means that we need to run there only the Airflow scheduler and the Airflow web server. These are the only two components because they will be shared between all teams and they are not dedicated to one particular team. So cool, this is a nice start, but we still need a place that is dedicated to each team. And from Kubernetes point of view, of course, this is the namespace. So obviously we need to provide a namespace per team. And when using this approach, now we need to provide some other feature and Kubernetes resources on top of these namespaces. And the first one is actually the service account. So what is a service account? It is like a user and it has some permissions. So all of our service accounts, they have exactly the same permissions but the only difference is that one service account has these permissions only for one namespace. So for example, the team one service account will have these permissions only for the team one namespace. And this way we can provide a security isolation between the teams because these namespaces, they will not be able to communicate and interact between each other. But what more we can add? Well, have you ever had a problem that you have a monthly bill, let's say $1 million, and you need to split this bill between all teams based on the usage? This is quite easy to be implemented in Kubernetes, and we can add a resource quota to each of these namespaces. So what is actually the resource quota? It adds a hardware permission per team. So for example, we can say, okay, team one will have only a hardware limitation of only 100 CPUs and one terabyte of memory, and team two namespace will have a restriction of 200 CPUs and two terabytes of memory. So 
At the end of the month, using this approach, we can easily split the bill based on the usage and the hardware limitations per team and the dedicated resources per team. So cool, what is the next step? Well, it is arguably the most important step. Now, the Air Force scheduler need to trigger all the worker pod instances to the team specific namespace based on the owner of the DAC. So if the DAC is owned by team one, the Air Force scheduler needs to trigger these specific task instances for this DAC to the specific namespace that is dedicated to this team one. And it should also use the service account for team one. So this is what we need to provide. And actually this is our, these are our basics of the Kubernetes architecture. So cool, let's move on to the next component. And as I already mentioned, this is the PostgreSQL. So how to improve the PostgreSQL and how to make it multi-tenant? Well, the answer is simple. We don't need to make any changes there. And if you are wondering why, why don't we need to make any changes there? Well, the reason is pretty simple. We don't want to make changes there because if we make some changes, we need to modify the schema. We need to modify the Air Force internal code. And basically we will need to fork the project. And this is another requirement to our team. We don't want to fork the project and we would like to use the open source, open source Air Force version and to upgrade to the latest Air Force versions as soon as possible when there is a new release. So obviously we need to provide all of our changes on top of the Air Force source code, on top of the Air Force source open source product. So how to make Air Force multi-tenant? What are the basic steps? Well, obviously we need to provide some changes in the source code on top of the open source solution. We need to redesign the approach. And actually the first step is to provide a module per team in the DAX module. But how is that beneficial? Well, as you can see, the DAX module contains all DAX for all teams, but we can easily split them between each of the, these modules per team. So this will provide a separation between the teams and we are going to know which team is owner of which DAC. But obviously this doesn't provide multi-tenancy. This is just a separation per team and that's it. So we actually need to provide multi-tenancy in each of the Air Force native components. And I'll start with the first one with the connection and our approach there. So we can easily do it by extending the connection class. And you can see this example, we have an extended connection class. We can just extend the connection class and we have only one function there. It receives one parameter, the connection ID, and that's it, it's pretty simple. And the logic here is there is also simple. Based on this connection ID, we just need to get the team ID from the DAC. And we can easily get it because from the task instance, we can get the file path for the DAC. And once we have the file path, we can, e because we know the pattern, we can easily split the DAC's home directory and we can easily get the team ID value. And once we have the team ID value, we can add it as a prefix to the connection ID. So how is that beneficial to us? Well, using this approach, for example, if, if I'm part of team one, and even if I know the connection ID for team two, even if I copy paste the same connection value in my own team one DAC, this generic logic will add my team one ID as a prefix. So the final value will be team one underscore the connection ID. And the real value, the real final value for team two in their DAC will be team two underscore the connection ID. So obviously this provides some kind of a security isolation between the teams. But obviously this extended connection class is not used in Airflow and we need to somehow integrate this logic in a way to all other Airflow components in the operators, hooks, sensors, and etc. And we can use the same approach, the same basic approach. We can extend all hooks, operators, and sensors. And as you can see in this example for the S3 hook, we just have one class that extends the S3 hook, the extended S3 hook class, and we have only one constructor there. So basically we first initialize the, bear, the parent S3 hook constructor, and after that, we use the extended connection class to just modify the AWS connection ID final value. So using this approach, we can integrate the security concept in all of the operators, hooks, sensors, and etc. 
But most probably now you're wondering, okay, you can use this approach, but I can still use directly the S3 hook class and go around the solution. And you will be right. You can do that, but we have a fix for this too. Basically, we forbid access to all natively provided by airflow hooks, operators, sensors, and etc. For every one of these hooks, operators, sensors that we need to use in our platform, we extend them and we add them in our source code. So we forbid access to the natively provided services by airflow and we allow access only to our, our own and custom built products. Of course, this adds an additional overhead to our platform because now we need to add, uh, for example, if a team, some team want to use a new operator, we need to add this operator, we need to add tests for this operator and et cetera. But this adds an additional overhead, but the positives and benefits for this solution are much more than the negatives and the concerns. And actually using this approach, as you can understand, it's not a very generic approach, but if you want to make it more generic, basically we need to fork the project. We need to make some future factoring in the Airforce approach and the project at all. And again, this is not our, this is against our requirements and our needs. So obviously we need to provide this basic and a bit hacky solution. So cool, partially Airflow is multi-tenant, but still we need to run all of the Airflow worker posts per team in the team specific namespace. So how to do that? Well, we can use the Airflow local settings.py file. And as you know, it provides two functions, the policy one and the pod mutation hook. First, we use the policy function and it accepts one parameter, the task instance object. So first we can use the same approach. For this task instance, we can get the file path from the DAC and we, because we know the pattern, we can split the path and get the team ID value. And once we have the team ID value, we just need to set it as a label to the Kubernetes executor. And basically that's it about the policy function. So the next one is a pod mutation hook. And as you know, this function is executed right before executing and creating the pod object in the Kubernetes cluster. So in this function, it receives the pod object. So we, now the first step will be to get the team ID value from the labels for this pod object. Once we have the team ID in this function, we need to build the final value for this specific team, the name for the namespace based on this team ID. And then of course we need to attach this namespace value to the pot object specification and more specifically to the namespace property. And basically that's it. These are the basics and this is how we provide multi-tenancy in Airflow. But Airflow is not completely multi-tenant system at the moment because still all of the teams and the engineers will have access to the other team source code. So it will be great if we can somehow split the source code between the teams and of course provide a security isolation between them. And we can again easily do this by redesigning the repository structure. So at the beginning, we have only one huge area for repository, but we can provide some features and changes to this logic. First, this repository contains all operators, hooks, sensors, plugins, and of course, all DAGs for all teams. So we can easily split first the operators, hooks, and sensors to a new repository, and we name this repository the Airflow system code. We name this repository the system code repository because it contains the system logic, and this logic and this repository will be shared between all teams that are going to use our platform. And the rest of the code in the Airflow's huge repository now will contain actually all DAGs for all teams. And the solution here is pretty simple. We just need to split all DAGs per team. So we need to provide a repository per team and each of these repositories will contain the team specific DAGs. So having this approach and architecture means that we don't need a huge Airflow repository anymore. And that's it. This is our basic architecture. We have an Airflow system code repository and a repository per team for the DAX per team. And basically this is about our architecture and our basic needs and how we provide multi-tenancy on top of Airflow. But we have some other features on top of Airflow too. And I'll give the word again to my colleague and friend Emil who will talk more about these other features. 
Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. So now that we know our architecture, let's talk about the execution environment we were able to provide on top of Airflow and Kubernetes. So first, uh, I said in the beginning of the presentation that we that we re use Airflow mostly to replace our ETL solution, our legacy ETL solution. So I will use the ETL process as an example to follow up this presentation. So we have a simple extract transform world process where you have some data sources, you apply some data transformations or aggregations, and after that, you load the output to a data destination. So in the context of Airflow, when you need to extract some data, it's pretty straightforward. Mikhail already mentioned we are using AWS as a cloud provider, so use an already existing operator as an example, Redshift to S3. So you pick up this operator and you can either reuse it or just extend it with the things you need. When it comes to loading the data, uh, it's very straightforward again, since there is an operator S3 to Redshift, just the opposite, uh, the opposite action. Okay, but what happens when we need to transform the data? What happens when we need to apply some data aggregations? What happens if we want to run a data science model on top of this data. And in order to explain that, I will use this ETO process and show an example workflow that represents this. And I will use this example in the presentation. So we have task one and task two, which are part of our extraction. And these tasks run simultaneously. And when they finish, task three depends on their output. And here is the place where we need to apply some data manipulation. And after that, the output of this, we want to uh, ingest somewhere. OK, remember this picture. So what were our goals here first? First, we wanted to provide a language agnostic jobs. And by language agnostic jobs, we mean that we wanted to provide a way each of our users of the platform to run their jobs, no matter what language they're using. So we have, at Financial Times, we have a lot of different teams using different technologies because they have different goals and different missions. And this is why we want to provide opportunity for them to run different kinds of jobs and don't want to depend of the Airflow project because we know that it's Python based. Also, we want to provide cross-task data access. This is the more inter interesting topic. How can we actually share the data between different tasks? So we will cover these topics now during the presentation. So first, let's talk about our integration with Kubernetes. Mikhail already said we have Kubernetes and our Airflow runs inside Kubernetes. He already mentioned that we use Kubernetes executor, so each task is run as a Kubernetes pod. But there is one more extra feature that comes with Airflow, and this is the Kubernetes pod operator. And what this operator does is basically just run to run a Kubernetes pod. And since the only things you need to provide to this operator is the Docker image, the Docker tag, and the pod name you want to run, of course, this is the uh, the minimum uh, requirements, and you can reuse a lot more than that. But in order to make this run, you just provide a Docker image, basically. And since we are using images and Docker containers, now we know that we can provide this language agnostic opportunity to our users. Cool. So first, we achieved our goal with the language agnostic jobs. Let's talk about the more interesting part. How can we actually share data between the different tasks? So first, Let's forget how can we share the data. Let's talk about how can we first store the data. How can we actually sh store the data for each task in a unique place? Since when we have a lot of DAX and a lot of tasks in them, we know to uh, we want to find a way to store the output of each task in a unique place. And this was not very complicated since we knew a few basic airflow concepts. First, we are running our, our airflow in a multi-tenant platform, and every DAC is part of a different team, and we can separate the output of each DAC in a different folder. Okay. After that, we know that every DAC has a unique ID. Other than that, in the context of, in the context of a single DAC, you cannot have more than one task with the same ID, right? And other than that, we know that when we schedule a DAG run, we cannot schedule more than one DAG run with the same execution date. And following all those four principles, 
we know that this unique pattern team DAG ID task ID execution date is unique for each DAG run. And in the context of a simple DAG run, we know that the only difference between all the tasks in this DAG are the task IDs. Keep this in, in your mind. Okay, so now we're using again the power of the extensibility in Airflow, we can introduce new functionality and we introduced another operator, which we call execution environment operator. And this operator is very simple. If we have the Kubernetes spot operator, which is spawning a Kubernetes spot, our execution environment operator is just another Python class just who, which just inherits from Kubernetes spot operator. But we wrap the execute main logic inside this operator, adding pre-execute functionality and post-execute functionality. Nothing more. Okay, so this is what the execution environment operator does. But we need to find a configurable way to express this cross-task data dependencies. And in order to explain that, I will share, uh, share what we invented in our data platform. First, you can see at the bottom of the screen how we de uh, define our execution environment operator task. This is our task ID equals task tree. And we say that we want an example image and uh, just a tag. And the only extra parameter we introduced here is this job config. It's basically a, something like a data contract. This is how we call it, data contract between Airflow and the jobs that run on top of it and the jobs that this job is depending on. Okay, if, if we look at the configuration above, we can see that the only thing we are providing as an input to this task tree are the task IDs of the tasks before that, task one and task two, nothing more. Okay, when we talk about the output, we can see that uh, it's again a simple configuration and we support again, multiple outputs since we can have a use case where our job wants to uh, have multiple uploads, like having a data science model where you have your result and some uh, metrics, for example, that should go in a different destination. And since we're talking about destinations, as you can see, we provide the opportunity, the user to provide multiple data destinations. You can upload your, upload your output to many different places. You just provide the type and you, you, also, you also provide the meta information in order to make this upload. Uh, successful. Okay, now that we have an opportunity to configure this, let's see what's happening in this pre-execute logic. First, we bootstrap the environment. Of course, we need to find a way to uh, make this da data, we need to persist, appear on the execution environment pod. We also need to bootstrap the environment with a few environment variables. Other than that, we need to enrich the configuration. And by enrich, I mean add more information to this data contract. Since we have only the task IDs, the one thing we need also to provide is the location of this data. Where is the data from previous task located? And this is something we know how to generically build. Also, we have to export this configuration because it's a data contract between Airflow and the jobs that are getting executed by Airflow. So we export this configuration as a JSON file. And the only thing that our execution environment Docker image is depending on is the one environment variable. And this environment variable is pointing to this exact uh, data contract we have exported. This is what we do in the pre-execute logic. What happens in the post-execute? In the post-execute, we handle the execution, whether the job succeeds or not. We also clear the bootstraps and of course deal with the output uploaded where it's required. So now that we know how we configure the dependencies, let's see, and what do we do? Let's see how the data actually appears in the execution environment part. First, we started with a simple PUC with AWS S3 as an intermediate storage. What does this mean? We just upload the output of each task to simple S3 bucket. And when we need to persist this data in another task, we first download and after that execute the task. And when the task succeeds, again, upload the data to S3 and this over and over again. But here comes the question, is this efficient? And obviously this is not efficient since if we are talking about megabytes, probably this is efficient. But when we are talking about tens and hundreds of gigabytes, this is not efficient for a couple of reasons. First, 
we have to support multiple downloads and uploads. And this is not efficient for two reasons. First, it's very slow when we are talking about big load. And it's not very efficient because of the huge traffic we have to generate. And this is not cost efficient. Other than that, we have the problem of having a single processing power. Since we know that the Kubernetes pod operator is spawning a single Kubernetes pod. Also, we have to always load the data in memory and we can achieve uh, another improvement here. So how to evolve the execution environment actually? First, we need to remove those unnecessary data transfers. Also, we have to parallelize the processing, uh, make this uh, environment scale vertically, not only horizontal. Sorry, make this environment scale horizontally, not only vertically. And other than that, how can we provide the so-called hot data access? So first, to remove those unnecessary data transfers, we had to find a way to share the same file system between all of our pods. So we introduced another Kubernetes feature, which is the persistent volume. And the persistent volume is just to reserve storage in our uh, cluster. And if we, if we have our Kubernetes and all of our tasks running as Kubernetes pods inside it, we know that the Kubernetes persistent volume can be attached to all of our pods. This is it, just a storage that can be shared between different resources. But there is a problem in that. When I start talking about the persistent volumes, I said that this is a reserved storage, which means that this is a limited storage. And what happens when I wake up tomorrow and I see that the storage is not enough? I have to pre-reserve again, and this will not be enough in the future again. And this is a problem. It cannot scale. So we introduced another functionality. We reused again the, the capability of the persistent volumes to point to a remote NFS server like Amazon EFS. And since the EFS can scale unlimitedly and you pay for what you use, this was the perfect fit for our use case. OK, we removed the unnecessary data transfers. So far, so good. But how can we improve even more our execution environment? So we have to parallelize the processing. And we know that we have one worker and we want to scale the environment more horizontally. And we know that this can happen thanks to Apache Spark. So we invented something called Spark Execution Environment. But what are the benefits of the Spark? What Spark provides us? First, Spark runs perfectly in Kubernetes, which is awesome since our whole infrastructure is Kubernetes. Also, it supports many distributed storages, and you will understand why this is beneficial uh, in the next couple of slides. Also, it allows faster data processing by parallelizing the processing, spawning multiple workers, uh, and this is it. It also supports multiple languages. Uh, we also keep our language agnostic environment by supporting Java, Scala, R, Python, even SQL. And last but not least, Spark is very easy to use. It's very explicit. So OK, the Spark execution environment operator, what does it do? So first, it inherits from the execution environment operator, but with a few extra steps. We again bootstrap the pre-execute with setting up the Spark environment. We create service account required in or, uh, for Spark to run in Kubernetes. We expose some environment variables that are required for Spark to run successfully. And I think this is it. Probably I'm missing something, but these are the main steps. Also, in order to make Spark run, we need to have a Spark-based image, of course. And in the end, we have to clear all the resources and all the bootstraps we did for this job. These are the extra steps we add. So how does it look in our architecture? We have Airflow in Kubernetes, Kubernetes executor running Kubernetes pod. Our Spark execution environment runs a Spark driver. This Spark driver runs multiple workers. Those workers process our data load, and after that reports everything to Airflow. Simple as it sounds. OK. This is our current state. We have removed, removed our unnecessary data transfers and we have paralyzed the processing. We increased the speed. OK, so now I will talk about only one or two minutes. What are our future plans? We know that we can provide the so-called hot data access. And what is the hot data? The hot data is th that data that is more frequently uh, accessed. So we can split the data between hot data and cold data. The hot data, again, I'll repeat, is the more frequently accessed data. For example, we have task one to four. If 
all of those tasks depend on the same data set. Do we want to load those data sets every time? No, we don't. Since we are going can we can share this data between the tasks if this data is already in memory. So we can use a tool like Alexio. This is just an example. Uh, we researched and this is one of the opportunities we can use. But I picked Alexio as an example because it has perfect integration with the Spark execution environment because Spark supports many distributed storages and Alexio is one of them. So I think this is the end of our presentation. I think uh, we're running uh, out of time. So first, I would like to thank you uh, for listening. I would like to thank again for the invitation to this event. And I think it's time for Q&A. OK, thank you, Emil and Mikhail. Um, let's start with questions. Uh, if anybody has any question, you can post it directly on the Crowdcast or on the Slack, and, and we will get it from there. So the first question we have, actually by Jarek Potuk, uh, he asks us if, are you protecting against malicious users? In Airflow, you cannot really protect from running custom code in the scheduler or the workers, even if you limit which operators, hooks, or connections are used, and you use extend connection, etc. So basically, there is no way to protect against injecting a code or modifying the database. So how are you protecting against these malicious users? Well, that's a great question. Uh, so obviously, we cannot fully protect because of the Air Force native architecture without doing fork of the project. So we try to do our best to provide a separation between the teams. We provide some some other security checks. Uh, for example, of course, we have a CI CD pipeline. We add different additional checks, security checks that analyze the code as well. And we somehow provide uh, additional security features on top of this architecture. And we also removed the, actually the credentials and connections from Air Force point of view from the metadata database. And we currently use the latest feature from the latest Air Force release version that Actually, we used the Vault uh, secret backend, and we moved our we moved our credentials there. And this additional step to provide a security isolation between the teams. So obviously, we add, we add some additional features, but we cannot fully protect from uh, accessing other other team uh, DAC and uh, functionality. But at least we provide some basic separation between the teams and you need to go really hard to actually use other people's code and data sources. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, somebody asked us, how do you move data between hot and cold storage? So as I mentioned, this is a feature that we want to introduce, but it still does not exist in our environment. So definitely this is not something I can answer right now since we don't have it implemented. But uh, definitely this is a pro something that is in a research phase. So I cannot explain deep, uh, deeper how can we do this. But basically, the Alexio stores data in memory. It reads from, it can read again from a remote storage, and this is the way how you can uh, transfer. But we haven't implemented it yet. We know that only that we know it's possible. But I cannot say anything more right now at this point of the time. Okay, thank you. Um... And the next question is, um, the way you are restricting the connections, can we also do the same to restrict RBAC? I don't know if those are the, if those mean something. RBAC access to the DAG based on the folder? Well, currently we use our internal approach. It's not using the RBAC approach in Airflow. So probably it's possible to implement it in a more generic way, but currently we have a custom build solution and we apply this custom build solution on top of all of the airflow resources that we need to provide and actually expose to the consumers and the stakeholders of the platform. So yeah, probably there, 
probably it's possible to have a more generic approach, but this is our current state at the moment. We are still working in progress, in progress on our Air Force application, and we still have a lot of plans for the future, but this is our current state. Okay. Let me double check. So we're done with questions on Crowdcast. Let me see if there's something else on the Slack directly. I think that's it. Well, thank you so much, Mikhail and Emil, for, for sharing uh, how you're using Airflow at Financial Times and what are your plans. Um, hopefully, uh, you can you can continue being on, on the on the rest of the event and provide us feedback and provide the, continue providing the developers feedback so they they can continue uh, the roadmap for Airflow. And hopefully you can also uh, contribute some of what you're doing so that it gets back to the, to the project. Thank you too. Okay, Thank everybody. Next talk is our next talk of the day is give me a second. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so our next talk is migrating airflow based Spark jobs to Kubernetes the native way by Roy Tebet and Itai Jaff. Uh, that will be in 13 minutes, 13 minutes. Uh, in order to connect to that session, you can stay in this room. You, you will be automatically carried over. Uh, in the meantime, remember that uh, we are on, on the Apache Airflow community Slack. And uh, you can also check out the virtual swag bag for the promotions and offers from the event website. Once again, thank you, Mikhail and uh, Emil, and see you around. Bye. 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 Bye.